All right, everybody. This is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at nine o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, but mainly how to grow it. And uh, in today's episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to be talking about the remainder of the spring fruits that I'll be um, expecting to be ripe over the next couple weeks. Uh, as some of you guys know, we are quickly entering the summer, at least uh, in terms of our summer solstice is approaching. Um, however, it feels like it's been summer here in the Philadelphia area for uh, quite some time. Probably you know, sometime around the 27th of May, it seemed like we really got warm very quickly. And that's normally what happens um, here in this climate. We have a, a shorter spring and a, a very short fall as well. And so we have a longer summer and a, a pretty darn long winter time. So um, what I want to talk to you guys, because we just we did talk about in last week's episode, we talked about the first fruits of the year and what I was harvesting um, from my perennial fruiting uh, plants. Now we talked about, I think even before that, we've talked about some perennial food sources, regardless of whether or not they're fruits or vegetables or mushrooms. We talked about those. Uh, then again, we talked about the first of the, of the spring fruits. And now we're going to talk about fruits that are now ripening um, towards the end of the, the spring here and the beginning of the summer. So, um, one of the fruits that really comes to mind, at least for me, um, at this time of the year is the blueberry. And I know a lot of you guys um, are big fans of blueberries. And I have, I would, you know, estimate some of the, I would have probably, honestly, one of the better climates that you can have for blueberries. And I think these photos here <laughs> that I took last year really accurately depict that. I mean, some of my blueberry plants just get loaded. I have quite an acidic soil here for some reason. Our clay is, it's clay, but it's also um, somewhere around six on the pH scale. And blueberries need an, uh, an acidic soil. So uh, for somebody like me who has clay, which also holds a lot of water and almost never dries out, that's another big issue with blueberries is that you need to fix the soil first. If the soil's right, you're gonna succeed. So with the blueberries, you don't wanna let them dry out and you wanna have an acidic soil. Somewhere around a five to a six is probably best for the blueberries, which does present some challenges because it's tough to maintain that pH level. Uh, some of us may have to continually check that um, and actually apply amendments to the soil. Um, I originally planted my blueberries in about a foot, six inches to a foot of peat moss. Um, but others that I have planted in the past, I thought I would just throw them in the ground and see what happens. And they're in the clay. And it's 100% clay, no peat moss. And they're doing actually really well as well. I mean, they're really, uh, they perform phenomenally well. So. Quite soon after what we talked about in last week's episode, we talked about some of the fruits that, that ripen, like the strawberry. Uh, we talked about the gumi, the red currant. Uh, there's one here that I'm kind of blanking on. But these particular fruits, uh, oh, the honeyberry, that's right. These particular fruits um, are nice because they're so early, but I do find that this second half of the spring or this last part of the spring is really um, kind of changing over a new leaf towards a lot of the fruits that a lot of people really start to enjoy. So things like not just the the blueberry here, but the uh, the apricots, the cherries. Um, you start seeing not just the the regular Bing type cherries, but the bush cherries. You start to see the raspberries. You may even see, if you're lucky, you might start to see some of the first blackberries as well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of these fruits that we're going to talk about are kind of like already fan favorites, people that people know what most of these things are. Uh, there is a couple, however, that some people don't really know of. And 
there's a whole list of these berries that if I go on um, ediblelandscaping.com, they do a really great job, this nursery of growing all the weird and interesting fruits. And actually, Edible Landscaping, Michael McConkie did a virtual tour of his property because uh, normally he has a day where everybody comes. It's called All About Fruit Day. And it usually happens in the spring. But because of the COVID-19, he uh, couldn't show you guys, unfortunately, a live tour. He did a virtual tour. And on this virtual tour... It really was wonderful to see all the different things that he grows and all the, the states of everything he's growing. And um, some of the berries in the very beginning of the episode are kind of weird and interesting. And some of which I have grown for a short time, some of which I thought I should grow. And some I thought maybe it's just a little too much to try these just yet. Um, some of them are, you know, f the lingonberry as an example. And if you go on their website, you'll see. Some of these, even the cranberries, I think, had some fruit on them, but they weren't ripe just yet. Um, I believe the lingonberries were ready, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but these are more, these little berries here are kind of in the family of, um, if I'm not mistaken here, yeah, they're, they're vacciniums, which means that they're in the same family as I think the blueberry yeah so they're all sort of in a way rela related to the blueberry and therefore they ripen early they need a similar soil requirement ish kind of thing where they require this uh, lower pH or a lot of organic material and they don't want to get dried out and they're doing better in like in colder places um, let me see if a cranberry here yeah cranberries are also vacciniums as well interesting so it says right here that clay so soils should have 80% moist peat worked in the top four inches of the soil. So there you go. I mean, it's just, it really does prove it right there that um, these all these vacciniums that you can grow, and even blueberries, by the way, which we can talk more about, um, they, requ they require that soil, but uh, even blueberries have a particular type. They have different types of blueberries. There's all different types, if you guys didn't know this. And there's a website that uh, maybe I'll find it here. It's a nursery that I think really has the big uh, – yeah, this is it right here. I think they're called fallcreeknursery.com. And I believe this is them. Uh, maybe not. Maybe they changed their website. And I'm just not recognizing it here. Um, but there is a, let's see here. Maybe I can find this chart. Yeah, I'm not finding it here. I don't know if it is Fall Creek Nursery. I'm going to find it here because I think this chart is really going to drive my point home. But there's different types of blueberries here. And there's high bush blueberries that grow taller. There's low bush blueberries that stay low. There's rabbit eye uh, blueberries. There's blueberries that don't need a whole lot of chill hours. Um, they've really been breeding these things. And it really does depend on what it is that you're kind of going for, how you're growing them. But you can see on this website, here's the high chill varieties that they have here listed. And they, they actually start breeding, I believe, most of these plants. Um, and you'll see these high chill, these are the varieties that are the varieties that I grow that need a lot more chill hours for them to set the fruit. And some of these varieties really are quite interesting. And I really got into this um, a lot more than maybe some people should. Um, because you could probably in a northern climate be really safe with three varieties of like Duke and Jersey, Elliot, you know, you don't really have to get crazy with these. They taste relatively the same, but I found that over, over a longer period of time, uh, of growing these, that there are some, um, varieties that are more of wild types 
and the wild types actually do have an interesting flavor to them that isn't necessarily um, the same as the others. It's actually quite interesting. So I have a variety that actually is ripening now. As it's one of my first varieties to ripen. It's um, ugh. I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Now I forget. Let's see here. It's called Chippewa. There you go. So my Chippewa is a half high blueberry bush, and it is that has that wild flavor to it. In fact, it was even described on where I bought it at Burnt Ridge. They said it may not really get pollinated very well, but I've seen the thing have really heavy fruit set on it. So it does well here as a more wild type with a different flavor. I also have a lower type blueberry that grows as a ground cover along the ground. And those also have a, it's a smaller berry, but they also have a very wild flavor to them. And overall, as I said, they just do really well here. If you pay attention to the soil, you get yourself something, you set it up right. That's low pH. It holds a lot of water and doesn't dry out very easily. Um, you're going to have a lot of success with these blueberries. So for me, I don't necessarily, I like eating them as a snack. I'll go out there as I do with most of these fruits. I end up just grazing all day. I'll go outside all hours of the day and just start eating on different fruits, different vegetables in their raw state. And, um, the blueberry is a good one to eat like that. Um, in my opinion, however, I do really like making jam out of the blueberry. I think the blueberry, in my opinion, makes one of the best jams. Um, I also am a really big fan of blueberry pie. Uh, blueberry flavored really anything blueberry pancakes blueberry syrup blueberry literally everything so for me I really should not eat them fresh because <laughs> it is one of the fruits that I, I like processed the most so I think that's what I'm gonna focus on this year we got to put the nets on them and I'll come in here at a later date and I'll start harvesting these maybe I'll use some for blueberry pancakes or whatever and um, I'll be really happy. That's really what it comes down to. I think that's the big deal with these blueberries for me anyway. Um, so they're starting now really around the 15th of June is when they start coming in here. Now there is a type of blueberry, but it's not really a blueberry. It looks just like it. It tastes just like it. And if I can find them here on their website, uh, they're called June berries, but there's many names for them. Saskatoons, um, service berries. They have all kinds of different names and these literally look just like them. They're very hard to differentiate. What they have though is a seed and they're a bit seedy, um, more seedier than blueberries, but they're just pretty much the same thing. Uh, the difference though, is that they ripen probably maybe a little bit earlier or around the same time. So these would be coming in right now if mine were of age. Uh, they have a different shape. Some of them are very large. Some of them are a lot smaller. Um, but the big difference is that they do not require specific soil conditions. So they don't need the, uh, the low pH and they don't need the extreme amounts of moisture at all times. So they're a really good alternative for maybe some of you guys out there uh, who want to put, want to have blueberries, but it's just more difficult for you to have blueberries. So I would just recommend, I know my friend Big Bill up in Lancaster, he's got a lot of bedrock of limestone and therefore his soil is very basic. So if he doesn't have that acidity, he's tried it for years and he wasn't able to do it. He couldn't get blueberries to work no matter how hard he tried. He told me he put a lot of effort into it and it just never works. So he decided to uh, grow figs actually. <laughs> but uh, what he could have done, I think, and maybe he's doing it now, is try the Juneberry. Um, yeah, so it's really a very similar thing. Um, as I said, it, they can get really tall. Some of these, you know, this one here, the regent that they listed is only four to six feet tall, 
whereas this autumn brilliance Juneberry is a uh, 15 feet spacing that he re that they recommend so if you look in their video it really does show you how crazy some of these June berries can get how big they are and whatnot it's uh it's kind of insane now by the way Michael has this tiered strawberry bed that he's talking about right now in this video if you're watching me on YouTube you know what I'm seeing but He's got the strawberry plants on tiers at his waist and at his chest level, which just makes me think, oh my goodness, why haven't I done this? Why this is this should be my life right now because I just cannot stand bending down for like every day I've been doing this or every other day for 30 minutes every, every other day of bending down and you know, it's back breaking work. You could have it on a tier and this is just, again, this is what I'm going to do in the future. It really just comes down to this. Um, yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. But anyway, here he's talking about lingonberries. He's talking about, yeah, there's some berries right there that aren't ripe just yet. Oh, oh my goodness. We almost forgot about the mulberry. And the reason I didn't think of the mulberries because I don't have any mulberries this year. I didn't have any last year either. And it's really a shame. Um, but for good news for everybody out there who is following along, we have successfully grafted our Girardi mulberry um, onto the seedlings that we started or that we had grown out for an entire year last year, grafted them this spring and two of the three have taken really awesome really excited to see that and those are the variety it's a variety called Girardi and you'll see uh, see some photos of it it's extremely extremely productive this is no this right here is no joke um, no that's not really the best photo I'm not even sure if that really is a great photo either to really do this plant justice. I guess you could say that's a pretty decent photo right there. Ah, here we go. This is a really decent, this is a, probably what they all look like. And believe it or not, um, you know, Michael McConkey in his virtual tour at Edible Landscaping, he was talking about the Girardi. He was talking about the weeping mulberry, which is behind him. He was talking about the uh, another dwarf mulberry that he grows, which I didn't really have a whole lot of success with, so can't really say I recommend it, but his Girardi, he has two of them, I believe, and they're massive, they're huge. This looks like, if I'm not mistaken, uh, these are his Nanking bush cherries, and those will be ready, I imagine, in a little bit. Um, and then here's actually some June berries, if I can find it to get you a photo of what his June berries look like. I think that's a filbert. Honestly, it was so interesting and cool to be able to watch and see all the things that he's growing and see them in a different way. Because you just don't normally see this. I don't normally... I'm usually the one, unfortunately you know talking about all these weird and interesting fruits it's good and it's refreshing i mean michael mcconkey is like literally one of my heroes so it's really awesome to be able to see somebody like him doing this you know um trying to find the june berry here and you'll get a good idea of what this looks like I may have already passed. I mean, he t he mentioned so many of them as they went on through the video. And there's his Girardi. And there's his bush cherries right there, which are ripe. So in the video also they're right I don't know I may just never find well that's a really interesting blueberry plant that thing's loaded um, 
more loaded than mine. I guess they're older plants. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I guess we're never going to find the, uh, the June berry. <laughs> unfortunate but uh, if you guys go into that video you'll see all about them um, now again I think we covered a lot of the mulberry actually we've talked about the mulberry really in great depth over another episode of fruit talk that we did we talked about all the different types of mulberries um, there's the Morris Nigras the Morris Albas the Morris Rubras um, that was an earlier episode of fruit talk and we broke down all the different types I'm growing actually a couple of the types. The Morris Nigra, I'll give you guys an update on. That's one that I have to grow here in a pot, and it's more difficult to grow in in uh, in in more humid climates. That one I'm not really a big fan of so far. And still this year, although it looked beautiful, it was doing quite well. It had a decent amount of fruit on it. I probably would have had more fruit on it if I didn't really knock off some of the buds earlier this spring. But overall, I'm not really that impressed with the productivity and also the flavor. So we have to be really blown away by that mulberry for me to keep it. Otherwise, it's gone, I think, this upcoming season. I did manage to propagate one of them uh, from cutting. I'm one for one. So that's pretty cool. But uh, I am really looking forward to having mulberries again. And being able to net the tree is really a big benefit. That was my big issue with the Illinois Everbearing that I had. It got to 20 feet tall in three years. Very difficult to net. And I've realized actually there are some strategies to keep them smaller. So I've been really impressed with someone on Facebook in the one of the mulberry groups there that I think Bass, my buddy Bass is the, he's the one who runs it. Um, or at least he's the one who created it. And there's a guy in that group recently that posted about his mulberries and the way that he grows them along wires and along espaliers and the way that he cuts them. It's really interesting. And even though it is ill and everbearing, like, or I guess you should, I could say you could still use ill and everbearing in that manner that he was and it would work and you could keep them very productive and you would have a reasonable size that you could um, you could protect uh, and harvest from. So for me, um, sort of my view on mulberries of larger sizes, besides the dwarf ones that I decided to switch over to, it's been sort of reinvigorated. I have a new appreciation for larger mulberries. I would definitely like to try a white mulberry. I still have yet to really get a handle on those. And um, for me, I think that would be the next big step in my mulberry adventure is to try the white ones. Um, and you know what, if I have to grow one that's a bit larger, so be it. I'll just have to figure out a way that I can grow them. And I bet you I could grow them as a really low growing cordon. It probably would be really quite interesting uh, to see how they do um, as a low cordon. Um, anyway, so the mulberry, I think we can, we talked about that one to death over the past or in the past. Um, we've also talked about the bush cherry to death in the past, as well as the Bing type cherry. And we did an, another episode comparing the two differences. I really have become a big fan of the Romeo and Juliet. Um, this year we had a weird, interesting phenomenon happen with the pollination and I don't know if it was the pollination or maybe it was the frost or maybe it's just because they're young. I don't necessarily know the answer, but we have very few bush cherries this year. And it's a bit disappointing because I really did want to try more of the more of them. I wanted to have more cherries. Our white gold and black gold cherries are kind of vacant this year. They've been stripped by birds and squirrels and um you know, I think the cherries are more of a fruit, although there's so many things you can do with them and process them. It's for me more of a fruit that I'm going to eat fresh rather than process. Um, yeah, so let's see what else, what else do we have ripening now? So the raspberries are coming in and we haven't put a whole lot of thought and time 
into the raspberries just yet. I think on Fruit Talk, we haven't really talked about them too much. And normally, I think that's because the raspberries come in um, in the fall. And in the spring, yes, you can have them. In fact, you normally would have them in such high quantity. But this year, I decided to actually let the first crop go. Normally, I cut that out because the birds mostly get it and I don't net the plants. And it doesn't seem really all that worth it to me to have, you know, uh, the nets on those. It just seems like a lot of work. And, you know, I can always do without some raspberries. But it's been nice to have these raspberries so early in the season. Um, the the fall gold and the Caroline raspberries are ripening their first crop. I may get some Ann, uh, which is the yellow raspberry, uh, but I don't know if I killed it or pulled it out. We did some maintenance and I may have actually pulled that one out completely by accident. Um, so really quite unfortunate and uh, unbelievable that I did that but I may actually have something left in there I don't know Um, I may actually get to taste it soon I don't know I have to really look at it but all these raspberries depending on the color have a different flavor and the the royalty I imagine I'll get to try as well later this year in the form of the the primacanes right there's two different crops there's the floricanes there's the primacanes the floricanes are on the second year wood, and that is the crop you get in the spring, where the primacane is the crop you get in the fall. And the primacanes um, produce so much fruit for me from August till frost that it's just insane. I get a pint of raspberries every day from Caroline. Every day from August to November. So for me, I think they're quite underrated. underappreciated not talked about people don't really ask me about them the videos I put out on strawberries and raspberries even though they're so reliable so ridiculously good you don't have to ever buy them at the store ever again once you plant them yet I don't really hear much about them and people don't really uh, I think really pay attention when I talk about these things I don't know it's weird so for me I um, I really appreciate those berries, um, but the what I was getting to is that the flavor corresponds to the color, or the color corresponds to the flavor. So, as I mentioned, I have yellow raspberries, pink raspberries, red raspberries, purple raspberries, and black raspberries, and they all have different flavors. And I think that's what my main goal here is, is to find out which color I like the most. So far, it's not like I like one color so much more than the others, but I do like the the pink one so far, I think slightly better than the red ones, which is kind of weird, but maybe it's just because it's a bit different. I don't know. But I think what we should do is that we're going to come, I think, at a later point in the season when I actually get to try more of the colors. You get to try the yellow ones get to try the purple ones. I may not, I'm may i not going to get to try the black ones this year. But once I get a hold of the four of them at least, get to try those, then maybe we can do a video on that and then we can come to some sort of conclusion and, and uh, we can talk more about them in a later episode of Fruit Talk. But yeah, that's one of the things now that we have them in the spring. We're letting the floricane crop ripen. They're coming now. Um, at the end of the spring, beginning of the summer. And actually really in high quantity as of yesterday. Okay. So we did, I think in a way, we may have talked about them in one of the last few episodes of Fruit Talk, but the Alpine Strawberry, that is also ripening. We have the White Soul variety. It does taste like pineapples. That one I think would normally ripen a little bit after the June bearing types and all the other normal strawberries that I have. But I am thinking that it is quite early, obviously, and would ripen at least by this time of the year on its own. And uh, they're doing really well. They're putting out a lot of berries. I'm impressed with them. I do enjoy them. 
it's a nice change of pace. The strawberry, we actually have changed a little bit of our opinions from last episode and that still have not released the strawberry taste test video because I want to reserve judgment a little bit. But I did get to taste more of the Purple Wonder, more of the Rucker Scarlet. More and more impressed with the Rucker Scarlet as every day that goes by. Every time I try one, every time I eat one. The uh, the Purple Wonder, also impressed. Uh, some of them, it seems like, are a bit watery. Not really all that flavorful for whatever reason. Maybe it's going to be more of an inconsistent strawberry. I don't know. Uh, it's definitely not getting that purple color, but it's getting close. It gets close and that's good enough for me. And a couple of them that I actually got to try that were well ripened and for whatever reason were better than the rest of them, um, actually had a very interesting flavor, quite similar to the Mar de Bois, uh, but different. And for me, I think actually they're both keepers. I'm interested to see what the purple wonder does. I'm interested actually to propagate more of them and, and spread them around the yard. I think I'd rather have both of those over the early glow um, for sure. And the only reason I keep the early glow around is to see if whether or not um, it's one of those strawberries that is just much earlier than the others and that would fill some sort of gap in the season because uh, having an early source of food because the strawberries are the earliest thing, that would really mean and make a big difference to me. All right. The currants we talked about last week, the black currants are now ripening. Um, probably in the next couple weeks, more so than right now. But they're also ripening. Uh, the gooseberry is ripening over the next two weeks as well. I may see some Josta berries this year. Um, I do have one that I received from my buddy Lance and it's either a gooseberry or it's a Josta berry or it's a currant. <laughs> They're all in the same family, but I believe it's a Josta berry and uh, it will fruit for me this year. So I'll get to try the Josta berries, I think, and I'm excited for that. Um, now what I have, I do want to talk to you guys about is not necessarily the currants, the gooseberries. We can get into them in a little bit, maybe. Um, I mean, there's not much, a whole lot to say about the gooseberry. It's really just an early grape is the way I like to look at it, right? You got the gooseberry that ripens in the end of June, early July. Um, whereas the European grape ripens in August, September, and then the muscadine grape ripens in October in, uh, in the fall. So you got different levels of these grapes. And the, you know, the, the gooseberry actually is quite a good grape. It's underrated. I find them to be pretty good. Um, they're easy to grow, super easy to grow, very problem free here. I have no issues with them. The black currant, as we mentioned, I think in last episode is just, you know, something you really want to process supposed to make some of the best wine and jam and liqueurs and you know all kinds of things like that so again a fruit that you process i do enjoy them when they're very ripe off the plant eaten fresh they kind of taste like cheese in a way if that's not the craziest thing you've ever heard uh they do they remind me a lot of like cheese so weird, wild flavor on those. Probably the most interesting flavor of any fruit I grow. It's just out there is the is the black currant. Now another one that I would say is extremely out there is the honeyberry, and they're ripening now. Uh, although they we included them in last week's episode, we didn't really talk too much about them. Uh, but those are you know something that's really becoming. A big deal. I know they're popular in Japan. Canada's really breeding them. The University of Sasquatch, Sas, University of Sasquatch. Yeah. Uh, so they're so they've been breeding all these different varieties of uh, of honeyberries, and 
there's a number of them that are coming out, like the Brio Beast, the Brio Beauty. It's supposed to be more sweeter than the other varieties, have a higher bricks. Uh, it's tough to get them perfect. It's a learning experience, and some people don't really like them at first. It's not really until you pick them for multiple seasons and really when they start to mature. Mine still have not matured. They really are taking their time. It's kind of a disappointment in a way of how long it really does take for these things to get their act together. I don't necessarily get it. Some of them really, uh, yeah, don't have the same results that some of these other growers are having, I think, with their honeyberries. It's not like they're not growing either. It's not like they're not healthy. Um, I don't know what it is with the fruit set. It's always low. The amount of flowers I get is always low. Uh, and then the birds get a lot of them because they are the first thing to turn blue, as we mentioned. But, you know, as I've mentioned, I think, in other videos, it kind of reminds me of a kiwi plus a grape in terms of the flavor. The gooseberry is kind of similar in flavor, I find, but less wild, uh, you know, less of a more complex flavor to it. Um, but yeah, I think that the honeyberry is a weird one and actually it's quite good. And I'm really looking forward to having more of them. I just had some that really blew me away. Um, and I was like, wow, that's actually pretty darn good. Um, so again, it's all about that timing. I think I could have even let them hang on the bush even longer. It really just comes down to, I think, netting them. Um, kind of like the blueberries and letting them just get a lot of their crop ripe and then do a big harvest. Um, sort of similar, I guess, in that sense. And again, I think, as people have mentioned, they make really great jam. I'm sure they're good in so many ways processed. But I do find, believe it or not, that they are a really good fruit when eaten fresh. So I've been quite interested to get more of them and grow more of them and you know maybe i should put more of them in sunnier locations it might just need a, a lot more sun to it or something i don't know but let's see here we've also got i think that's it now that i think about it i think that's mostly it so yeah what's ripening now the blackberry the raspberry oh we talked about the cherry and the apricot, we just don't have any uh, this year. It's really unfortunate. I should start seeing some, I imagine, some nectarines reasonably soon, um, as they did ripen last year on 624. So that, if that's any sign, and I do have a ripening chart here uh, behind my computer, it ripens apparently... Um, around july 20th but that's in a, a colder area of pennsylvania so maybe i can get them sometime in in like the first or second week of july um so i don't know how i was getting some of them last year on the 20 24th of june <laughs> that's crazy but they were ripe uh they definitely were ripe but i know for a fact it is the the first uh, fruit of the peaches and the nectarines that I get to eat. Um, it's even before the flat peaches, the Saturn donut peach that I have. And it's even before some of the white peaches I have. Um, I think Red Haven actually ripens mid-July. Um, No, Red Haven is the first or second week of August or something like that. Anyway, the point is is that, um, yeah, we're going to start venturing out into these different stone fruits like the plums as well. Uh, as it says here, I got some Santa Rosa plums, 624 last year. Actually, I think that was with a bubblegum plum last year. Why does this say Santa Rosa? I'll have to check my records here. But I believe I, it is the bubblegum plum that actually does taste like bubblegum. It is the bazooka bubblegum flavor. 
Um, so these things are going to start coming in at the end of the summer or at the end of the spring, very beginning of the summer, the nectarines and the, uh, and the plums just come out of nowhere. And if you can believe it, even some apples ripen at the beginning of the summer, which is really crazy. Uh, but I had a pristine apple last year and I think I may even get one this year. Uh, the tree isn't really loaded all that much, but even my zest star may ripen quite early this year because that is a very early variety. Um, William's Pride is very early. Pristine King David. No, King David's very late. So Pristine, William's Pride. I don't think William's Pride has any fruit on it. And zest star has a lot of fruit on it. So who knows how early the zest star will be because it's not very early it's just classified as early um, so we'll have to see there uh, interesting huh it's cool how you can have even though the apples of fall fruit you can get some apples believe it or not as early as <laughs> as the beginning of the summer which is just crazy that's really mind-blowing um, there's so much diversity in apples and then also the uh, the fact that some of these these stone fruits come in. I really would like to eat more stone fruits. They just, for whatever reason, have not done well for me. I've never pruned them all that well when they were younger. Um, I never really got them in the ground soon enough. Um, they still just need some age to them, more time to mature. And we'll have a couple more seasons with them for sure to really see if we can get some really nice fruit off of them. I am sort of seeing some fruits still dropping, unfortunately, on the peaches. Some fruits are still dropping on the apples, um, even after we did our thinning. So that's disappointing to see. Um, but overall, quite impressed. I'm really happy with how the season's going. How much fruit I'm eating. Oh, I did also eat my first main crop fig today, yesterday. The 15th of June was my first main crop fig. So that's pretty darn awesome. Although it really wasn't all that great. It's still really cool to have uh, figs that early in the season. And then I want to talk to you guys about two more, one more topic. And then we're going to answer some questions that people put in the, uh, in the comments here of last week's video. Um, as we did every every week now, we're going to ask you guys for some questions. Put them down in the comments, and we'll do a Q&A at the end um, to get back to people here. So, yeah, one of the topics we actually talked about last week was girdling fig trees. This was after our episode. At the end of the episode, I should say, we talked about that. And we talked about how they could be in a hormone, a state of hormonal imbalance. And I was trying to figure out if they would ever shake this hormonal imbalance because certain varieties just seem to be a lot worse at that than others. And will they ever overcome that with age? Does it matter how I prune them? Does it matter how I train them? I really was trying to get to the bottom of this question to see if girdling would work. We still, we did, we performed the technique. We still are waiting on some decent results here to see what really the deal is. Um, now, I will say that I did a little bit of research. I asked a couple friends, heard what they had to say about this. Nothing really all that conclusive, but what I did come up with is a couple passages in Pons' book, and I was really impressed because I think this may have a lot to do with the answer here. So I had already sort of really aimed to do this in the future with my in-ground trees. And I never, I guess, really discussed this really all that much in detail. But you guys know, they're spaced so close. They're two feet apart on center, three rows of the fig trees, underneath a six foot wide low tunnel. They're really packed in there quite tight. And um, what I've noticed here is that, at least in the book, 
is that light is becoming sort of an issue. And what I had planned to kind of give them all their own space because they are so close together, they're, they're spaced very close together. I really need to control the plants. I really need to get a handle on giving them their own space, limiting the number of shoots, limiting the area that each tree can grow in. So I thought thinning is going to be a really important key point there. I also thought that staking a lot of the, the new branches to make sure that they're in certain areas, not encroaching into other fig trees would also be really important. Um, so in my mind, I sort of already had planned to do this, but Pons here mentions actually some good benefits of that beyond really how closely spaced they are and how each tree needs their own space. But beyond that, and then also how this relates to hormonal imbalance, which I thought was just so cool. So he, he talks about light. And of course, fig trees need full sun, right? Everybody knows that. We need light. Um, the more light, the more heat that we can get. He mentions here, however, though, it is essential that different parts of the fig tree, even the less exposed, receive abundant light. If the branches and foliage of the crown is too thick, the shortage of light inside the tree will prevent the formation of the fruit buds. Similarly, if the insulation of the trunk and branches, especially in young trees, is excessive, it can produce an imbalance between the root absorption and the transpiration of the aerial parts, causing blah, 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 blah. Um, so, basically you need to have a nice balance of the canopy and you need to have some light penetrating into the canopy. Now, if I'm not thinning, which I really didn't do a whole lot of thinning this year on my in-ground trees because I wanted them really to grow and grow and grow, um, to establish themselves this year. If I thinned them and actually had staked the branches, I probably would have a lot better results with this hormonal imbalance, or at least this issue I think that's happening. He also mentions in fig trees in terms of, I think he mentioned this in his, his pruning discussion, in the fig trees that produce figs in August, pruning must be kept to a minimum possible virtually reduce the removal of the terminal buds. I know this, that's a fact. Less pruning is always better for fruit set the following year. Um, now, and that's winter pruning, by the way. So uh, that's just not possible with the system I have. We have to prune them down to a much lower height every year to, in order to protect them in the, in the winter time, but also to get them off with the low tunnels onto a nice head start. But he also says in young trees, in order to benefit the ramification of fruit bearing branches, pruning is limited to simply removing the terminal buds. In contrast, old or weak trees require a more severe pruning to revitalize the shoots. So he's sort of saying that at a certain time, these trees actually will mature. They will be get to a certain age where they will sort of slow down and they will shake this, uh, this having this hormonal problem and also this extreme amount of vigor because they're young and they, if you prune them too much, you're really hurting yourself. You're shooting yourself in the foot. However, if it's old, you need to really pr uh, prune them a lot harder to really revitalize the tree and get those vigorous shoots. So there is a nice balance, I guess, somewhere in there. Um, will this work on every variety? I guess that means yes, right? But how long is that gonna take? I don't know. Now, the last thing here I wanna read you guys is also on the pruning here, which I think really, it really sheds a lot of light on the topic. He says the basic criteria governing this type of pruning that he's mentioning. Um, first of all, you need to have a good balance between the root system and the aerial part of the tree. 
which will have to be maintained throughout the lifespan of the tree. So that's what I mean by the hormonal balance, right? If we have too much on top, we're going to have a balance of what's on bottom. If we have too much on bottom, we're going to have an imbalance of what's on top. So it's it's got to be in balance at all times. And that's what he's sort of mentioning here with the hormones. It is also important that each individual part of the tree is balanced in relation to the other in order to achieve a harmonious and uniform development of the crown, the crown, uh, which is the canopy of the tree. When the tree starts to produce and is loaded with figs, excessive weight can blah, 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 blah. Okay. Forming a tree is too robust, which is too robust, induces a delay in fruiting. Maintaining a very dense aerial part can cause difficulties in tree absorption. Um, since nutrients are taken away from the fruiting. In any case, the formation of the tree structure must be done in the shortest time possible. Trying to respect the tree's natural bearing and minimize the number of cuts as much, much as possible, making good use of the shoot production and choosing the strongest and best placed. Formation starts by pruning of the apical bud um, or, or master at the desired height. Then three to six sprouts are selected at different heights of which two or three will become the master or main branches. During the summer, the selected shoots have to be adjusted and the strongest leaves, uh, the strongest shoots emerge. Elsewhere, plants are formed uh, with more branches. even bending or arcing them, arching them to create productive formations that facilitate collections. To, traditionally in the Balearic Islands, formation was very high, mainly because work in the fields was done by harvesting animals, which need to be suitable. Blah, 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 yeah, so what he's basically saying here, um, is that it's even a good idea, he says, to first off, select the branches that are healthier, obviously. And this is, of course, forming the trees as trees, not bushes. Um, but he also mentions here, um, elsewhere he says, plants are formed with more branches even bending or arcing them to create productive formations that facilitate collection. Um, so I guess he's talking about bending the branches so that they're in a more, uh, a better way to be able to be harvested. But what this sort of got me thinking about was actually the cordon systems, the Japanese espalier way of growing figs, which in a way, if you get the right formation of the scaffolds and the right formation of these branches, and they're even sort of far apart, you then create a wider canopy that's not necessarily as dense. It's a lot easier for it to be, for light to penetrate through. So if you can kind of develop your tree, and, and this is sort of what a, you know, a Japanese espalier does on its own, is that those Japanese espaliers, they really space out the spurs. They space out the fruiting branches allowing just the right amount of light penetration into the canopy of the tree, uh, which really aids in the fruiting of those branches, yet they are cut back so hard every single year. So I think it's really interesting, and that may just be the answer. I think that's probably more of the answer than anything. Um, Maybe it's a combination of a number of different things. But what I'm going to do next year, as I said, is we're going to be thinning very heavily. And then whatever branches we decide to keep will be pruned. And maybe I'll even do some limb bending right this year to expand a little bit and widen the canopy of the tree so that when they leaf out next year, I can bend the branches wherever I want and have the right canopy, that light penetrate through the canopy. So really manipulating the the structure of the trees to my benefit is kind of the way it's kind of what i'm getting at here i may even consider really thinning out a lot of the shoots um 
And I don't really know what I'm waiting for there, but that's something we can think about as well. All right. Um, so that is the end of fruit talk here. I want to answer a couple questions we have in the Q and A, and that will be the end of it. Um, all right. So I think really the only question here was from Clive Parsons. He said, uh, he said that when rooting cuttings, would it benefit root growth if you did it in a dark space? I don't think so. I don't think it has anything really to do with the dark. Really, people put them in the dark in the beginning um, so that you're not adding to desiccation. Because if it's in the dark, you don't have any bright, hot lights desiccating the wood that's on top above the soil. Uh, now, if uh, it's in a dark space, you actually don't have as much heat because those lights do add some heat and do warm the soil, I find. And therefore, I find you may not have, actually, you'd have the opposite of a benefit of root growth. You may have less root growth because you don't have the optimal soil temperature. So if you had the optimal soil temperature of around 78 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and it was dark, then yeah, I would say yes. But if, uh, if it wasn't dark and you still had the 78 degrees, I would still say yes. I would still say it's the same benefit. So the fact that it's light or dark really doesn't matter. That only really affects what's on top assuming you have the same soil temperature. So anyway, guys, thank you again so much for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. I want to thank everybody. I'm going to thank you guys again. <laughs> thank you guys for getting to this this point of the podcast. At this end, this, uh, this far in, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I love you guys for getting this far. Please, uh, if you haven't already, subscribe. Leave a review of the podcast. Um, also consider supporting us on Patreon if you're so obliged. Um, we have two different tiers up there. Check out our blog, figboss.com. I really do appreciate all the support, and I hope to see everybody soon for next week's episode. All right, take care, guys.